Good afternoon. Thank you for coming back after lunch. <laughs> um, I'm going to tell you about some, a scientific project I've worked on uh, where we're crossing a border between biological and digital information. Um, so if you're as old as me, you'll have used some of these devices for storing something on a TV program or some information that's important to you or some data you're working on in a scientific experiment. But all, all of these things are old and they, they, well, they're not that old, they're as old as me, but they're gone, they're lost, they don't work anymore. Um, and maybe now, today, you're using some of these things. But how long are they going to last? Five years? Maybe? Probably not. What's going to come next? We don't know. How are we going to store all this information that we're generating all the time, all over the world? Well, put aside that question for a minute. Here's something that has lasted a very, very long time all over the world. Uh, it's, a tr it's a picture of a, uh, an evolutionary tree. It represents all the life forms on all of Earth. Uh, and they've lasted for three and a half billion years. And they've been passing on the information one to the next over all of that time, very successfully, very reliably. Uh, and they've done it using DNA. DNA is the thing in the cell, every cell of every one of you, of every living organism uh, all over the Earth that passes on the information uh, for years and years and years. Uh, and I work in an institute where uh, one of our jobs is to store on computers all the information about the DNA in all the genomes that scientists all over the world are creating. And that causes us quite a problem. It's an enormous amount of information uh, coming in every day, and we have to store that, and we have to put it on computers, and we have to give it back to everyone. You can all get it yourselves if you want it from the internet. Uh, and I was in a meeting a couple of years ago, and we were, we were worrying about how we were going to do this. How are we going to keep the computer systems going with all this information that was coming in? Uh, and we had a whole day of a very serious meeting, and then by the evening we'd got tired of having a serious meeting, and we went to the bar, and we were saying, isn't there some other way of storing all this information? Uh, and then we thought, well, DNA itself is a really good way of storing information. Is there some way we could use DNA to store the information? Not just information about genomes, but information about MP3s or documents on your hard disk drive or, or anything like that. And, and we know a bit about DNA technology, and we thought it might work, so we got another beer and we got some napkins out and we started making some notes. Uh, and we thought, well, actually, we can probably do this now, just about. Let's give it a try. Um, so what is DNA? DNA is a little chemical molecule. It's really, really small. Um, uh, and it forms a big, long chain of molecules. And there's four different types. They're called nucleotides or nuclear bases. Uh, and they have different names. And we would usually refer to them just by the letters. Uh, in the English alphabet that those names start with. It's A, C, G, and T. And you can make a chain, a molecule, that's a big, long chain of these letters and stick them together. And that's what DNA is. And then when you get two of those chains, they form this very famous double helix structure that's very well known for being what your genome is. But in terms of carrying information, it's just one long series of molecules. And you might as well think of it as a big, long series of letters, A, C, G, and T. Or if you want a different visual image, you can think of it as a series of Lego blocks. Imagine we have Lego blocks that you can build in a tower, and you can choose the order of four different colors, and you can sort of learn to read the, those colors, and you can send a message in there. And we thought we might be able to do this. So this is what the machine looks like nowadays for reading DNA. You take an actual sample of DNA out of the cell of a living organism, and you do a bit of laboratory work to prepare it, and you put it in a little test tube that's about this big, about as big as your little finger. And then that, those chemicals go into this machine, uh, and in a few days it can tell you a huge amount of DNA information. Coming later this year is this machine. It's much, much smaller. It does exactly the same job. So this is a technology that's really coming along very quickly. It's getting inexpensive, and it's getting very fast. Writing DNA is a little bit harder. Uh, it needs a special facility. This is a company uh, in California that have that kind of facility. Uh, it, it's what's known as a clean room, so it's very highly controlled so that there's no pollutants or anything in there. And in those boxes, they have a machine that, that, like the one you see on the far right of this picture, and that can make 
strands of DNA to order. You tell it what design you want, which chemicals you want, what series of letters, what color of Lego blocks, if you want to think of it that way. And it's like an inkjet printer. It's just like which you probably do own at home, most of you. But instead of coloring colored inks at a piece of paper, it colors... Uh, it, it fires um, chemicals at a little glass slide, and that forms, causes a reaction, and that builds up strings of DNA. So we can make DNA, and we can read DNA. Surely, we can do an experiment and put some information in there that we've chosen and read it back. So we did an experiment, and this cartoon gives you a little idea of the whole experiment, but I'll explain a little bit more about some of the details of what we did. Uh, but what you see on the, on the left-hand side it starts with our computer and some information on our computer, and then traveling across, that turns into DNA. It gets flown around the world in an airplane back to our labs in Cambridge, and eventually it went off to Germany, and we can read the information back. So what did we do? Well, we took a photograph of the institute where we work. Uh, that's it there. It's called the European Bioinformatics Institute. Um, and we took um, a fragment of a very famous speech. That wasn't... Thank you. Uh, by Martin Luther King, and if we're lucky, we can hear a little bit of that now. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Uh, and we took uh, a PDF file, um, actually one that contained uh, a very famous scientific piece of writing, which was the, the, the work by Watson and Crick from 1953. Where they're the people that discovered the double helix structure of DNA. Uh, and we took all of William Shakespeare's sonnets, all 154 sonnets, in a text file. Uh, and we took those computer files um, from my laptop computer, uh, and we invented a code. We took them from the computer code into a code that was made of the letters of DNA, or if you want to think of it as blocks of Lego, we made them into a code which told us what little blocks of Lego, but Lego is much too big, right? Remember, DNA is really small. Uh, and we took that information and we, we put it in a, another computer file and we sent that by the internet uh, to our collaborating company in California, the ones that can make the DNA. Uh, and they made some DNA for us. Um, and that took them a few days. And then they put it in a test tube. And they put the test tube, uh, actually there's a few test tubes, uh, in a box. And they put the box in an envelope. And they gave the envelope to FedEx. And FedEx flew it across to Cambridge. And that came to my office. And I took it out. And I took out one of the test tubes. And I looked at it. And I thought, this has all gone completely wrong. There is nothing in this test tube. But I was trained as a mathematician, so I don't know what DNA is. So I took it down the corridor to my friend, the, the laboratory scientist, and I said, they didn't send us any DNA. And he held it up to the light, and he said, no, look, it's there. Right? In that little test tube, which is as big as your little finger, there's a tiny smudge of dirt just at the bottom. It's not dirt, it's actually dry DNA. And that tiny, almost invisible speck of dust of DNA held all the information from one megabyte of files on my computer. To give you a better idea what that means, if we'd filled the test tube to the very top, full up of DNA, that would have had the same amount of information as one million CDs. Right? That's how small DNA is. So we took the DNA, and we took it to the laboratory where we have the machine that reads it, and we thought, well, did it work? Have we got anything in the DNA? What's in the DNA? So we decoded it, uh, and we compared the original picture, which is what you see here, with the decoded picture. And it's not the most exciting story in the world, but they are the same. Well, it's very exciting scientifically. <laughs> it's not very exciting visually. And we compared all the other files that we'd used, and they came out the same. So the experiment had worked. Uh, and we know it is possible to put the information we want into DNA, and it's really, really small, and we can decode it, and this is very interesting. <laughs> so we did some more science. <laughs> 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 
So because we're scientists, we had to push it a bit further. So we thought, well, we just did like one megabyte. That's fun, and we proved it worked. But it's not going to change the world, is it? So we did a bit more analysis, which I'm not going to try and explain to you. But we wondered whether this would work on on a larger scale. Could we do it with a hundred megabytes or a gigabyte or uh, on on the petabyte scale, which is what we deal with at work every day? Uh, and to cut a long story short, the answer is yes. Uh, it will work on a larger scale. Uh, and in fact, you can store all the information in the whole world, everyone's information, your hard disk drives and your memory sticks and your CDs and your DVDs and everything that exists in the whole world today. You could use this system to store that information. And if you did that, you could put it in the back of one van. All right. So, so that's very efficient and, and, <laughs> and quite fun. Um, uh, but there's other good things about DNA as well. So another thing is um, it lasts a very long time. It's not hard to store it. So if at work we have data centers full of hard disk drives and they're very expensive and we continually have to replace them and we have to spend a lot of money on electricity to, to make the hard disk drive spin, uh, but that generates lots of heat. So then we have to spend even more money on air conditioning so that the whole room doesn't overheat and the disk drives don't break down. Uh, DNA, you just need to keep it cool and dry uh, and in the dark, and it will last a very long time. And we know this is true, even though it's hard to do very long time experiments, because as scientists, we have taken DNA from the remains of mammoths, 20,000 years old, uh, from Neanderthals, uh, forerunners of humans that were 40,000 years old, uh, and, and from bison uh, that are known to be 60,000 years old, and in some cases from pollen samples and bacteria samples taken from ice in Greenland that were about a half a million years old, and we can still read that DNA. And that means that if we write a message in DNA or store some information in DNA and just put it somewhere cool, and dark and dry, we can store it very inexpensively for a very long time. Now, these facilities already exist. This is the Svalbard Global Seed Vault. Uh, it's, it's on a Norwegian island, and it's been cut into the hillside. Uh, it's, it's below zero all year round up in the Arctic Circle. And once you've gone into the hillside, it's dark. Uh, anywhere that cold is a very dry environment. And currently, this is being used to store seed samples against some terrible global disaster where we need to repopulate the Earth with plants. Um, but exactly the same st kind of store could be used for DNA if we wanted to make an archive of all our global information, if we wanted to store Shakespeare's sonnets for all time, or, or photographs that were important to us, um, or, or maybe just the records of where nuclear waste has been dumped. Kind, information you don't want to lose for a very long time would be safe for thousands of years, and we wouldn't have to do anything to keep it safe except leave it alone in a building like that. Or maybe you want an application a bit nearer to home. How would you do this at home? Well, you have those conditions available to you at home. You could get your little sample of information in DNA, and if you put it in the refrigerator, it would be just fine. You could leave it there as long as your refrigerator was working, as long as you remembered to take it out when you cleaned the refrigerator, put it back in again afterwards, uh, or give it to your friends, or share it with your children, or anything you wanted to do, you would be fine. Um, so that's really all I wanted to tell you that we've been able to do. Um, you can take all your digital information, you can put it in a test tube of DNA. The amount of information is so big that we don't even really understand numbers that big, which is why I didn't explain that graph to you. Um, but it all works. Uh, and I hope to be back here in, in about five years, you know, selling you some of this stuff. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>